Thank you all, and thank you all for joining us um, in this session um, at, the, at the Doha conference, and welcome to our prestigious panel, um, especially um, His, His Excellency, um, the Foreign Minister from, um, from Somalia. We're very grateful that you've joined us. Next to the Foreign Minister um, is the SRSG um, James Swan for Somalia, and right at the end is my, my colleague, Claudia Gazzini, who is responsible for our Libya work. And we've left the last seat, hopefully, um, that the Africa Union Commission spokesperson, Dr. Eba Colondo, will be able to, <laughs> able to join us. Um, welcome to all of you, um, participants, for joining us in this session. It's a very topical um, preoccupation that we have, especially um, in the Horn of Africa, North Africa, and particularly the Sahel, that we're here this morning to talk about how we unwind and deal with proxy wars um, in two critical regions of the, of the continent. Both sites are sites of great power competition. Our concern, particularly in Libya, um, is how to deal with averting a protracted conflict in that region that has spilled into the Sahel and into parts of North Africa. In the Horn of Africa, the location also of momentous change and transition as we're speaking is occurring in, in a region that historically has been prone to proxy conflicts, a region where we've seen internal conflicts of one country spill over um, into another um, um, re um, um, country where we've seen the domino effect of, of internal conflicts um, spilling into the region. And so our pr uh, preoccupation today is how we unwind those um, propensity to see internal conflicts spill over, how we address what we see as great power competition both in the region and in the wider um, international community, and how we build sort of a delicate balance of power um, in terms of international engagement and cooperation to resolve a number of these neighboring um, disputes, internal disputes, and also how we align the various interests of both international, regional, and local actors um, in, in, the, in, the, in the region as well. So I've told um, our panelists that I'm going to pose um, an op um, a, a question to all of them to give them all three minutes or so to respond to um, a particular question regarding um, their, their region and then we'll have some follow-up questions and we'll open it up to, um, to the participants. My name is Comfort Aero from the International Crisis Group and I'm the moderator of this session. Minister? Um, let me start with you, and it will be really helpful if we, before we dive deeper into questions around Somalia, that we begin with some sort of broader um, picture issue of where we are today in the Horn of Africa. I said it's both a region that has been prone historically to um, proxy wars, to regional um, conflicts spilling over into other countries, but it's also a region today that is on the verge of some momentous and significant um, changes. Um, but proxy wars um, have long been waged, um, and in, in recent years by rebel groups, backed by individual countries, whether in the region or beyond. And with the Horn of Africa particularly, um, witnessing some significant change and transformation, um, do you see the prospects for more regional cooperation, more conflict resolution, or do you sense um, a continuation of spillover of crisis from one country to, an, to another? Thank you very much, uh, Comfort. I'm, I'm honored to be here in the, at the Doha Forum and on the same panel with, uh, with these uh, important people like my, the SRC to Somalia, my friend James Swan, and and, and others, uh, you use the right words for my for my region. Uh, indeed, Horn of Africa is going through uh, momentous uh, uh, transformation and change. Uh, I like to to report that uh, these uh, momentous changes are very are for the good. Uh, I'm very optimistic of the, uh, the prospects of, of our region, thanks to dynamic uh, new leadership, 
uh, for the last few years. Uh, the example of the uh, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Dr. Abi Ahmed, who just uh, won the, the Nobel Pri uh, Peace Prize. The president of my, my own, President Mohammed Abdullahi Farmacho. You know the new Prime Minister in, uh, in Sudan, in Sudan that's transforming Dr. Uh, Hamdouk and, and other uh, leaders are all committed to uh, leaving behind uh, many years of conflict and 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 and, and uh, undermining each other and instability, and are now coming together for economic integration and uh, and political uh, cooperation. So IGAD is. Uh, uh, compared to its past, uh, recent past, and compared to other regions, are overcoming uh, uh, its past uh, history of conflict. And, uh, and if countries cooperate, come together, then that also uh, presents an opportunity to also shield uh, or suffer away uh, uh, proxy wars and, and external uh, uh, interventions. So ours is, is one that's towards uh, uh, a good future of cooperation and integration and minimizing uh, conflict and, and limiting, although the, the danger is always present, of uh, proxy wars and, and external uh, intervention. Well, let me um, have a, um, have a follow-up question um, with you specifically um, on that and, and delve a little bit into Somalia and you know, the history of external interests, um, both within the region but also further into the region. Um, one of the key challenges um, for Somalia um, today is a sort of tension between the Somalia federal government and regional states. Um, how are you coping with that in the context of current shift in regional and wider international interest in the, in the Horn of Africa? Specifically, does the current shift in interna international geopolitics um, provide an opportunity or a challenge to achieving unity in, in Somalia today? Yeah, so uh, I think the, the tension is uh, sometimes uh, exaggerated, uh, old narrative uh, persists about Somalia. Of course, Somalia is, has com is coming out of uh, protracted, uh, you know, statelessness and uh, civil war and all of that. And uh, politics is always, uh, as Chantal Mouffe would have it, agonistic pluralism, you know. So even in normal situations, uh, Politics tends to uh, create tensions, but uh, Somalia, which is now um, reconstituting its state, would have uh, some challenges, uh, internal and otherwise. But uh, I can assure you that, uh, uh, as has been the trend, uh, Somalis will find a, a way of, uh, uh, you know, settling whatever uh, whatever disagreements. Uh, political or otherwise, that would also uh, help uh, Somali, uh, Somali in the process of, peace, of consensus building will also uh, prevent uh, others taking advantage as has been the, in the past to intervene in the, in the, you know, and to play one group against the other. So there too, on that front, I'm hopeful for the prospect. I'll come back to you, and I know um, our participants would like to ask you more questions on that. But to SRSG, um, Swan, you've been now SRSG um, in Somalia for, for over a year now, or coming up to a year, maybe more, I can't remember, but... It's just six months. Just six Sometimes months. Sometimes it seems like it a year. Seems like longer, because I know that we've, we've, we've interacted before. And I wanted to follow up with what the minister was saying and ask you from you know, your position... Um, as a UN sort of ambassador for, for Somalia, 
we've, we've often seen disagreements among international actors on the pathway to finding peace and stability, um, both in the region um, and in the region that you're familiar with as well in the, in the Great Lakes, but specifically in, in the region. And, and Somalia has always been sort of a center of, of disagreement and, and finding cooperation has always been a challenge. International actors always do not act in a, as a coherent whole um, when it comes to Somalia. And, and it's, in a sense, it allows various actors to use and abuse um, their relationships with, with international, international partners. How can the UN, how have you in your last six months been able to try and foster cooperation to deal with the various um, competing interests both within Somalia and the region and the wider inter, inter, international region? I say this especially with an eye on what is going to occur in Somalia next year um, the elections in, in, in Somalia. And also, I, I say this because of the shifting sands that we're seeing in the region as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Comfort. And um, uh, first, let me thank our Qatari hosts and uh, say that I'm honored to be on this panel, uh, particularly with my dear friend, uh, Minister uh, Awad. Uh, and I see many other uh, colleagues and uh, government officials from Somalia in the audience as well. Um, let me say, first of all, that uh, while we often look at uh, international involvement in Somalia as a negative, there are, of course, many examples where this intervention and involvement has been highly positive. Uh, to cite uh, one current example, of course, is the engagement of the African Union mission in Somalia. Uh, in the uh, opening uh, comments at the plenary session, there was discussion about uh, engagement with the African Union, and I think, in fact, AMISOM is a a signal example of cooperation between the rest of the world and the African Union in trying to address a security situation that's important for all of us. Uh, the African Union mission, now about 20,000 uh, troops, is uh, actively supported by uh, UN assessed contributions as well as by uh, direct contributions from a number of partner entities. I think it does represent a, a genuine global partnership to try to address security oh. concerns in Somalia uh, while supporting a Somali lead in that sector. In terms of uh, trying to foster greater uh, <coughs> international cooperation and coherence around Somalia, this is a, a, an important point because in the past where we've seen uh, good progress, uh, often it has been because the international partners are substantially aligned in their thinking and aligned behind a Somali and regional strategy for how to move forward. For example, during the period uh, roughly uh, 2011 through 2013, uh, we saw uh, a Somali roadmap uh, to end the transition period and choose a new government. We saw strong regional support for that, particularly from the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, and we saw strong international support driven through a number of mechanisms, but including the London conference process during that period. Uh, today, I think if we look at efforts to uh, promote international cohesion on Somalia, uh, we can see it at two levels. One at a high level, more global approach. Uh, there is in fact a high degree of coherence in the UN Security Council among all 15 members. Again, in the plenary session, there was much discussion about the role of the Security Council, but uh, I think we see today uh, both the permanent members, the three African Union, uh, African Union country representatives, uh, those from the Middle East, uh, all rallying behind a common set of messages about Somalia. Similarly, uh, in October, uh, we held uh, the Somalia Partnership Forum at which uh, more than 40 bilateral partners and multilateral partners came together uh, and agreed with the government on four areas of focus for 2020. And I think this really does speak to a high degree of cohesion around what we're trying to do. Uh, and briefly, uh, that Somalia Partnership Forum stressed the need for an emphasis on inclusive politics, particularly moving to national universal suffrage elections in 2020, uh, 
but also to a constitutional review process to be completed by the middle of 2020. In addition to these inclusive politics goals, there was a set of goals around the security sector, particularly moving forward to enhance Somali security capacity uh, and undertake a further well-coordinated op operations with international partner support against al-Shabaab. Some of these began during the course of 2019, but we want to see them reinforced and enhanced in 2020. So in addition to the inclusive politics and the security and justice agenda, an emphasis on uh, economic reforms, particularly achievement of a decision point uh, for Somalia as a highly indebted poor country. Uh, Somalia is very close to achieving debt relief. Uh, if it remains on track, this would be considered uh, in February or March of the coming year. And it's quite a remarkable achievement that both in terms of the technical requirements to achieve debt relief, uh, in essence, uh, uh, erasure of uh, approximately $5 billion in external debt, uh, that Somalia has made remarkable progress over the past year uh, to year and a half in achieving that, uh, that trajectory. Uh, and finally, on the economic development front, uh, Somalia has adopted a new national development plan and partners agreed at the Somalia Partnership Forum to align their efforts behind that national development plan. So there have been significant efforts to ensure that we have a coherent message internationally uh, around uh, the governance agenda, security agenda, economic reforms, and a national development program. Well, um, as far as you swan, let me press you um specifically on the elections, and Minister, I know you're, you're here, and you, you, of course, feel free to respond, but specifically from a UN perspective, um, Somalia, you know, as you said, is going to elections, and it plans to hold sort of a one-person, one one-vote um, um, election next year. From a security standpoint, is that possible, um, given the nature of security um, in the country? What realistically... Um, can be done to ensure that election that involves, you know, you know, involves more people and is more representative than the last one um, that we saw in, in Somalia? And, that, and how can we guarantee that the, that the country will stick to the timetable that it's planned for itself? But the big one is around the, the nature of the elections and the security and guaranteeing the, that it's fully representative of, of, of the people as well. Yes, indeed, this is a current focus of attention in Somalia uh, as the parliament is debating uh, during this period uh, the electoral code that will guide uh, this elections process uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, there has been great scrutiny to what the model uh, could entail. An initial draft of the, of the electoral code was presented in the spring but was subject to further review and consultations by an ad hoc committee. That committee has made recommendations to the parliament and parliament is now debating uh, a new version of this uh, electoral bill. I think, uh, Comfort, the way you characterized it as the ambition being a more representative and more participatory process is likely to be the watchword as this goes forward. Uh, again, there is strong coherence in terms of the Security Council and the mandate of the mission that I lead is uh, to support one person, one vote election process, and we're very much focused on delivering on, uh, on that mandate. In terms of the critical questions of uh, security, the earlier version of the uh, electoral code uh, indicated that elections would be held where possible, suggesting that there could be some uh, limitations in terms of the location at which the balloting would take place subject to considerations of security or other access questions. Uh, the government has also established an elections security task force, uh, which has recently begun a meeting under the chairmanship of the uh, National uh, Police Commissioner. And that uh, entity is going to be examining in detail what would be the requirements for securing the elections going forward. But for all of the, the daunting uh, difficulties of organizing such balloting in Somalia, 
I think it speaks to a broader aspiration on the part of the Somali people to have a greater opportunity to uh, participate directly in decision making around the future of the country. Again, one of the themes of, of this forum appears to be that of inclusion. Uh, and uh, there's great eagerness uh, to see uh, opportunities for more inclusive political decision making and also more inclusive decision making that uh, affords opportunities for women, uh, for minority uh, groups, uh, and for others who've traditionally be, been marginalized to have their say as well. I'm sure our, our audience will like to ask you both more questions around the elections. And as you rightly said, um, SRSG, the, the watchword for 2020, not just for Somalia, but for the region, will be rep representation and inclusiveness. So I, I know we'll, we'll, we'll debate that some more. But let me just turn to, to, to Claudia, because um, despite where it's located, it's, it's also very much linked um, to the Horn of Africa, North Africa, and, and the Sahel. And, you know, Claudia, we have a protracted conflict now today in Libya, more broadly, is it continued military support um, to, and in violation of a UN's arms embargo as well, and the funding for, you know, Field Marshal um, Khalifa and his Libyan National Army from various, um, um, from various um, external actors, um, but also on the other side um, of, the, of the conflict, we've seen both sides are being supported by, by regional um, actors or wider um, actors who have key interest um, in what is happening in, in, in Libya. These are fueling both sides' willingness to continue their, their, their fight. So much is at stake um, in, in Libya, but not just in Libya, but in the surrounding neighborhood. The war has become increasingly internationalized, as, as we've seen, um, reflecting the geographical, geopolitical um, divides throughout the Middle East and, and beyond. Can you explain to, to us, to our audience, um, the nature of that geopolitical divide um, and to what extent we can char characterize this as a, as a proxy war? And, you know, after that, I'll, I'll turn to ask you some more specific questions around solutions as well, but yes. thank you. Thank you, Comfort. Uh, as the SRSG was uh, talking about uh, Somalia and the international convergence and the cooperative uh, attitude of UN Security Council members, I could not but uh, note that the opposite is actually the case for Libya. We have uh, complete paralysis of the Security Council uh, members and their incapacity to uh, take a more active, uh, principled position with regards to the war in Libya beyond statements of concern for the uptick in violence, of violence in Libya and nominal uh, show of support for a political solution as opposed to a military solution, uh, there's very little action taken on that front. Libya has become uh, an internationalized conflict um, since 2016. The war actually now in Tripoli, uh, of course, um, uh, started in April of this year, but actually the conflict is something that, of course, started in 2011, but the polarization, the deep polarization in the country that we're seeing today manifested is something that started in 2015, 2016. And essentially, the question that various uh, neighboring states or regional powers have offered different answers to is, is over how do you reconcile legitimacy and power in Libya? Because since 2016, we have an internationally recognized UN-backed government based in Tripoli that is internationally legitimized. But you have centers of power, military power, that are outside of the control of this uh, government. You have a military center of power in eastern Libya with the forces that are uh, now labeled Libyan National Army, headed by General Khalifa Haftar. And so, the question is, how do you bring about or bring together power and legitimacy? For some states, for some regional states, the answer to that question is back the military, back the army. The army is the guarantor of the state. So you cannot have a functioning state unless you have a functioning 
army. So this has led to uh, more uh, considerable support for the forces of General Khalifa Haftar uh, in the name of counterterrorism uh, that is be, uh, was being played out in eastern Libya since uh, 2015 until today, uh, but now in the name of returning the Libyan state to its politicians. Then you have others who have answered the question differently and have said, no, the answer is not consolidating the authority of the army. The answer is consolidating this power-sharing agreement that led to a government based in Tripoli and offering this government the tools in order to gradually re-exert uh, control over the, the, the Libyan country and gradually exert control over state armed forces, police, and so forth. Um, so when we're seeing countries um, such as the UAE and Egypt backing the idea of returning a strong military to Libya, and we see countries such as Turkey now more active in backing uh, the second option, um, we are into a long-term struggle that is not going to uh, end anytime soon. Uh, so Libya is now on a course of not only proxy war in the sense of uh, doubled up in international interference into domestic affairs, uh, but we are in the long run uh, unable to resolve this conundrum of how to bring about stability because of these conflicting uh, agendas. And all the while the UN is unable or, yeah, is unable to provide the tools for an alternative response. Then I guess my, my next obvious question to ask you, um, Claudia, is we, we know that this month, last month there should have been a conference um, in Berlin, which has now been rescheduled um, to next year. What are the prospects that we can see in a realignment of interests? What are the prospects for getting um, consensus? You know, when you listen to SRSG Swan talk about consensus um, in a region that has been prone to um, sort of um, disunity you know, and, and difference, the, the picture that you paint in Libya is, is, is very stark. So what, what should we expect? What, what ought to be on the table? How do you, you, know, how do you get the key actors, the interest allied? You talked about um, key countries from the, from the Gulf, but we, should, we could also add to the to sort of other actors, Russia as well. So how, how do you align all these, these competing interests together? Yes. Uh, over, the past, uh, sorry, over the past two years, the, uh, the UN-mediated approach to uh, crisis solving in Libya was directed at the Libyan actors. So an attempt to forge some kind of new power sharing agreement or a new uh, political lineup that would ensure that these internal divides that have cut through the country's country uh, end. Over the past six months, the approach has changed. So we're not focused so much on uh, bringing about an agreement between the Libyan actors but bringing about an agreement between the external actors. The idea being that if we want to stop the war, then we first have to stop the international backers of the war in backing uh, the, their Libyan uh, partners. This has led to a process which is called a Berlin process, which you rightfully uh, said was supposed to lead to a conference uh, last month, but it's a shifting target. Uh, the conference will be held, if at all, only when there is a real convergence of positions. Uh, the process has been useful in providing um, a meeting, uh, meeting room for uh, the various actors of the Libyan uh, conflict. Russia is there, Turkey is there, the UAE is there, um, Egypt is there, um, countries that are not um, very... Um, uh, do not have similar occasions to, to share their thoughts. Um, it has produced a document which is in its final stages, which on paper is supposed to show that the internationals have reached a, a common uh, stance on Libya, uh, but that has not translated into action. 
we're still in a situation where you have uh, Russia, as you mentioned, that is being supported or possibly um, uh, funded also by regional actors in order to provide military support to the forces of Khalifa Haftar. We have a new uh, influx of weapons also uh, towards the forces of the Tripoli-based government. So the international effort is a good effort, uh, but it's, it hasn't translated into anything actionable that will allow us to, to end the war. Yes, thank you. And this is quite a depressing picture that you've just painted for us, uh, um, Claudia, very, very in comparison to what we've heard from, from both of you in Somalia. We've got about 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers to our panelists. And if any of you have got any questions, please raise your hand. Um, people will be roving around the room um, with microphones. And I'll ask you all to please keep your interventions to strictly one minute. I do not want to have to cut you off, so please save me from being rude to any of you. And um, our first speaker is a gentleman. Um, that, um, sir, yes, please, if you can stand up so the, the, um, the microphone can be taken towards you. This is the gentleman um, in the white kaftan, please. Thank you. So if you could just put, raise your hand up so they can bring the mic to you. Yeah, this gentleman here. Thank you. And as I said, please keep your interventions to strictly one minute, please. Thank you. My name is Khalid Miftah. Uh, I am Academy Research. My questions are by, uh, by Arabic language. There are similarities between the Somali case and the Libyan case in terms of the intervention of many regional and international agencies and also uh, religious groups. Geneva Convention states that uh, President Hoffer cannot be returned to uh, military position because of his position. يعتبر طرف مقابل لحكومة شرعية. كذلك هناك العديد من التدخلات داخل الدولتين وخصوصا الدولة الليبية سواء من روسيا، إمارات، الاتحاد السوفيتي، أخيرا جنجويد موجودين على الساحة الليبية. السؤال الآن ما هو الدور؟ خصوصا عندما يكون هناك مبعوث أممي داخل الدولتين لدفع هذا التدخل الخارجي وهل يستقيم أن نجعل طرفا غير شرعيا مقابل إلى طرف شرعي يتفاوض معه ويحاول أن يتواصل معه خصوصا فيما يتعلق بحفتر ليس لديه جيش بل هناك محمود الورفلي هو مطلوب من محكمة الجنايات الدولية وتم وضع على لائحة العقوبات في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية رجاء توضيح وتشريح المشهد أكثر من الخطوط العريضة والشكر Zahra Hassan, Chargé d'affaires de l'ambassade de Djibouti. Yes. Uh, I, I don't have, a, I don't, I would not say uh, I have questions, but it's just uh, comments that I would like to say. It's uh, um, as a Djiboutian uh, lady and my government, uh, we all wish, to, we all happy that Somalia, all achievement that she made and is still doing and sustainable development she's doing for recent years and is still continuing. And not uh, uh, Somalia and Djibouti, we have tied very good uh, relations, not because Somalia, she stood by us, by as Djibouti, by as Djibouti during an uh, independent movement, independent movement, and not because of that we stood by Somalia and we stood each other, and that's coming because of uh, our beliefs from both countries, uh, Djibouti and Somalia, we are brothers and not just uh, neighbors, uh, also, I, w I just want to say, uh, um, 
it's, it's good example and good example and hope for not just for Africa and uh, for Africa, but I think it's for all the world and all achievement that she's doing Somalia. And I'd like to say congratulations and all the best like for 2020 election coming on all everything coming on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. That's excellent. My next question is for um, the ambassador for, for Uganda to the UN, Adonia, please. Uh, thank you for introducing me, so I will not introduce myself. Um, Good job, I know you. <laughs> uh, quickly, um, regarding Somalia, and I'm glad to see my two uh, old friends on the panel. On Amazon, 10 years after, and uh, with all the progress and challenges, what does the exit of AMSOM look like? Is it the next elections? Is it uh, the training of the Somali National Army? I would want to hear more about the exit. And since the topic is proxies, what about proxies from the Gulf in relation to the Somali situation? It's not only the neighbors that meddle in Somalia, it's also proxies from outside. Lastly, on Libya, what is the African agency in Libya? You talk about other countries. The AU was ignored at the beginning, what is your assessment, Claudia, of the African agency in Libya? Thank you. Good. Um, one more question. There's a gentleman, um, this gentleman here in the front row here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ali Abu Sidra. Dr. Ali Abu Sidra. International. Can I use my mic? Here you go. Dr. Ali Abu Sidra, uh, Director of the Foundation for International Law in London. Uh, I am a Libyan, and my question is referring to the statement made uh, by Mahathir Mohammed earlier when he said that international disputes is better to be solved not through wars. And uh, what it seems that the, if we want to uh, allow uh, the issue in Libya and the problem happening in Libya to be solved by recognizing one party who is using force uh, it may lead to some settlement within a short period of time, but when you look at it in the long run, I think that is not a, a proper way of solving issue. Uh, and uh, my question is to the, uh, uh, related to the definition of army according to international law if we apply the criteria requested by international law, is that applicable to the army led by Hefter or not? Thank you very much. Um, Claudia, two questions for you on, on Libya and then turning to our, our friends from Somalia. Um, some very pointed questions to you about um, AMISOM exit um, training and also the role of, of Gulf, to use your choice of words, Gulf proxies um, in in Somalia. Claudia, let's turn to you first. Yes. Um, uh, let's go back to Libya before the beginning of hostilities in April. Um, when, when I'm asked the question of, you know, how is it possible to uh, engage with Haftar and allow him to consider himself as a counterpart to the internationally recognized government, let me say that before the, the April offensive, that was the diplomatic stance, not of the regional bankers of Haftar, that was the diplomatic stance of all states. Haftar was a reality in Libya that needed to be engaged with. Uh, delegations of European ambassadors went to visit him regularly. Uh, the UN uh, regularly uh, traveled to Benghazi to engage with him. So it was out of the question that, um, um, that one would not engage uh, with him. And the, the legal basis for such engagement was uh, an argument uh, according to which 
since it's the Libyan parliament that recognizes Haftar as the head of the armed forces, then he is legally the head of the armed forces. And hence, legally, even the internationals are allowed to engage with him. And this is not in contravention with UN Security Council resolutions. Personally, I find that a, a very uh, wishy-washy argument, but that was the reality of affairs. So, so it, is a, it was a fact that um, the whole peace process was constructed uh, with the purpose of reconciling uh, UN-backed government with this parallel authority, parallel military uh, authority uh, in, in the, based in Eastern Libya, and it is still the paradigm of the peace process in Libya. Now, the, quest, the, the problem becomes on whether such an approach is still uh, valid in a state of war that we're in now, if you're reaching out to the aggressor, if you want, uh, is this, um, in a certain sense, are you uh, condoning aggressive behavior, military behavior, and the change of power by military means, uh, or not? Uh, I, think, I think in a certain sense, yes, we are. Uh, and there's, uh, there are people now, there are states that would say that this is not the course of action that should be taken, but, uh, the UN and a number of other Western uh, countries still think that this is ultimately the problem that needs to be resolved, and hence this is the this is what uh, what has to be uh, put on the table. Regarding Africa, uh, the African Union, as such, has little agency. Uh, it has been always shunned out of the Libyan peace process, in part because it is a number of African states are viewed as. Uh, having inherited a pro-Gaddafi bias, a, a pro-old regime bias, and for this reason, the African Union is viewed by the UN uh, counterparts as a non-neutral actor because of this historical bias. But a number of African states, I think Chad, um, and Egypt, the last time I saw was an African country, uh, do have uh, agency uh, in determining course of action. Egypt in supporting uh, forces in eastern Libya, Chad also in, uh, in helping win Egyptian support and French support for, uh, for a new remapping of the security in southern Libya. And that's a good response, um, follow up to um, the AU chairperson's own interventions at the first session plenary this, this morning. Um, we've, we've literally got three minutes left, so Ambassador Swan, why don't I start off with you to answer um, Adonia's um, question about, you know, what does Amazon mean next year? You know, does it equal exit and training? And then, Minister, I'll ask you to wrap up with the conclusion as well of, of, your, of your own. Please, Ambassador. Certainly. Uh, first, with regard to any decisions related to the, the pace and the, the numbers uh, Amazon forces uh, present in Somalia. Ultimately, these are decisions that are taken through the African Union Peace and Security Council and then by the United Nations Security Council as these operations are UN uh, mandated. Uh, there is an active effort to ensure that any decision making is well informed by an understanding of conditions on the ground. And so uh, even uh, in the past several weeks, there has been a combined threat assessment uh, in preparation by uh, the federal government of Somalia, the uh, Amazon uh, contingent, and the United Nations to try to identify what are core threats that should inform thinking about the future of the mission. Obviously, those threats also need to be matched against what are objectives going forward. But, but there is a systematic effort to do this in a sound and responsible way. Uh, Sorry. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask the minister to, to conclude specifically with this question, um, your views on um, Gulf proxies um, and the impact on Somalia, even more so um, given you know, how the various international interests are impacting on, on Somalia with, with, with these new sets of actors and interests in your, in your country. So before I say a word to the uh, equation posed to me, I should mention that uh, Somalia is grateful to AMISOM and the sacrifices that has uh, been done. Uh, uh, we're grateful to them. Uh, AMISOM has given a space for, to Somalia to, to reconcile itself, to rebuild its uh, state institutions. 
and we should not see AMISOM, uh, as we talk when we discuss AMISOM, as the end goal itself. AMISOM is a means to uh, reconstruct the Somali state, to rebuilding or, uh, strong institutions for Somalia that could sustain the gains uh, achieved. So we should see AMISOM in that, uh, in that, in that regard. But when we focus AMISOM, AMISOM, then we forget the, the bigger picture and the gains that have been, uh, that have been achieved uh, because of AMISOM's presence and, by, and, and giving space to someone. Now the proxies, uh, uh, the situation is not as, as bad as it is in Somalia as it is in Libya. So the comparison made earlier, I think, is not, is not, uh, it's not that uh, uh, correct. We have suffered from uh, interference and proxy wars, but not anymore. And as, as more consensus building takes place in Somalia, the more uh, or the less the, 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 the impact of uh, 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 external interference or proxy wars is on Somalia. And I can tell you, I mean, uh, that in Somalia, we are we are confident that uh, that uh, because of the uh, the uh, the developments in our region, uh, Iga itself is coming, reconciling itself. The integration I was talking about will and and as Somali institution is uh, uh, mature, and as Somalis themselves uh, come to uh, consensus of the. Uh, of our state building uh, efforts. Election is uh, legitimate election, is constitutional reform, uh, you know, the economic program of that, uh, then we will be able to, uh, to, to prevent uh, external change. So we're not very much worried or concerned with, uh, even if there are some who would, who would wish to, to, to interfere in our affairs. We are confident that we will be able to withstand uh, such interventions. Minister, thank you very much. And we're all going to be marching with you next, into next year in that confidence that you talked about. Please join me in thanking the Minister, SRSG Swan, and, and Claudia. Thank you.